Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the first of a series of three lectures on Thevenin equivalents for small signal models for BJTs, bipolar junction transistors. These are among the most important lectures for EC3400 analog electronics because they cover material that I think is unique to the way Marshall Leach approached this material, and I haven't seen this in any textbooks. And actually, I should clarify, the first equivalent circuit we're looking at isn't a Thevenin equivalent. It's a Norton equivalent for looking into the collector of the small signal model of the BJT. Although, of course, you can always use source transformation to turn a Norton equivalent into a Thevenin equivalent and vice versa. We'll be using this kind of material throughout the rest of the class. When we get to MOSFETs, we'll do similar kinds of derivations. In this lecture, we're going to formulate a Norton equivalent circuit for looking into the collector of a BJT. And in the next two lectures, we'll do the same thing for the base and the emitter. So when I draw a transistor symbol in this lecture, this isn't indicating the transistor in its full glory. It's indicating the small signal aspect of a transistor. So here, all of the various voltages and currents we've drawn are using lowercase letters to represent small signal quantities. The symbol expands out into either the pi model drawn here or the t model. Now, all of the computations I'm going to do, you could do with either the pi model or the t model. I'm going to do them with the pi model. If you use the T model, you'll get a set of equations that are equivalent according to various formulas that we derived in the previous lecture. So you can do it either way. I'm going to assume that you've seen the previous lecture on small signal models, namely the hybrid pi model and the T model. So if you haven't seen that yet, go watch that and then come back. Anyway, we're going to compute a Norton equivalent circuit looking down into the collector. In terms of Thevenin equivalent circuits looking out of the base and out of the emitter. So we're assuming that whatever is happening out here outside of the base, we're able to abstract that in terms of a Thevenin voltage VTB, that's a small signal quantity, and in terms of a Thevenin resistance RTB, and we'll do something similar looking out of the emitter. So there may be really complicated stuff happening out here and really complicated stuff happening out here, or there might be simple stuff. Whatever is happening, we're able to encapsulate it like thus. Now, depending on what is out there, this capital R TB might consist of fixed resistor values that you would usually represent using capital R letters. But if there are other transistors out here, there may be small signal quantities involved. So there may be little G's and little R's inside of these big R's. So we tack our Thevenin equivalent for the base onto the left here and our Thevenin equivalent for the emitter down here. And now we need to compute a Norton equivalent looking into the collector. And essentially what this is going to let us do is it's going to abstract all of this out. So we're not constantly having to draw this small signal model and solve systems of node equations, yada, yada, yada. If you look in most electronics books, the first way they approach any given problem is to draw a small signal model. If you look at Marshall Leach's notes, what you'll see is that he avoids doing that. Instead of constantly drawing a small signal model, he goes directly to one of these equivalent circuits. And you'll find using these techniques, we'll often be able to write down results almost by inspection. It's pretty wild. Now, the presence of this so-called output resistance R0 can greatly complicate our analysis. So we're quite often going to approximate R0 as being an infinite resistance. So R0 basically goes away. Now, we're not always going to do that. There's one particular case of computing the Norton resistance looking into the collector where we're not going to use this approximation. But for computing the Thevenin resistance looking into the base and the emitter, and for computing the Thevenin voltages, we're going to use this R0 equals infinite approximation. So under that approximation, I0, this current flowing through this resistor here, R0, is going to be zero and IC is going to equal IC prime, and IE is going to equal IE prime. That's going to become important later. Okay, so I want to compute a Norton equivalent looking into the collector. Now, when we compute Thevenin equivalents, we like to compute the open circuit voltage. 
Since we're computing a Thevenin equivalent, we want to compute the short circuit current. So what we'll do is we'll take this terminal and ground it and then look at the resulting current. So I'm going to label the short circuit current using this SC in parentheses in the subscript. And in order to figure this out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a Kirchhoff voltage law equation for this loop here. So we can say that the voltage difference between the VTB and the VTE sources here, that's just going to be the losses down this chain of resistors. So by Ohm's law, I'll have RTB plus R pi times IB, the current flowing down it, and then I'll also add to that RTE times IE, the current flowing down RTE. So that goes here. Notice that this feels a lot like the KVL equation that we wrote when we looked at computing the DC bias points. And I should mention that these direct relationships are a result of the fact that we're using that R0 approximation. We're taking R0 to be infinite. If we didn't, then some primes would be involved in some of these expressions. And actually, the whole analysis would be a whole lot more complicated anyway. So let me take this equation and copy it onto the next slide here. And all we're going to do now is solve it in terms of IC. And if I look at this expression here, let me define something. I'm going to define a capital GM as being 1 over all of this mess down here in the denominator. So we can rewrite this as GM times VTB minus VTE. So we can think about this G here as being kind of an uber gain expression that encapsulates all of the various complicated effects of what the BJT is hooked to. It's mapping a voltage to a current, so it is a transconductance. And there are several ways we can actually write this expression. If you go back to one of the previous lectures, we have this relationship for beta that says it's equal to the raw transconductance of the transistor GM times the input resistance of the BJT R pi. And if we rearrange that expression a little bit, we can see that this R over beta term, that's just 1 over GM. So I can rewrite this as having a 1 over GM term sitting here in the middle. And now think about what this looks like if the RTB, the resistance looking out of the base is zero. This would go away. And suppose also that the Thevenin resistance looking out of the emitter is zero. This would go away. And in that particular case, big GM would just be little GM. There's yet another way we can write that expression. Let us remember from an earlier lecture that we have this parameter RE that's associated with the T model that you could write as R pi times alpha divided by beta. Well, if I rearrange that expression a little bit, I could write this R pi over beta as RE over alpha. So if I take that RE over alpha and plug that in here and then combine that with this RTE over alpha term, I get this kind of expression. Now, we got to this expression through some algebra and some known relationships. Remember, I started with the pi model. You could do this whole derivation with the T model instead. And if you do that, then this is the first expression for capital GM that you encounter. I can use these properties to get this expression that we derived using the pi model. So you can go either direction. And in the next couple of lectures, we'll incidentally compute two other ways to write this capital GM expression. So you have a lot of choices in terms of what you think is the easiest in any given circumstance. Okay, so now we need to compute the Norton resistance looking into the collector. And this is the most complicated bit of circuit analysis we're going to do in this trilogy of lectures, largely because when we're doing this computation, we're not going to use that R0 approximation. So we are going to include this resistance R0 here. Now, this is only for looking into the collector. When we compute the resistances looking into the base in the next lecture and into the emitter the lecture after that, we are going to assume that R0 is infinite. But here, we're not. Okay, so to compute the Thevenin resistance, I need to zero out these independent voltage sources. And now I can't just simplify a network of resistors because I have this controlled source here. 
So I can either drive the voltage here with an independent voltage source and figure out what the current is and then divide these quantities to get a resistance, or I can treat the current here as if it's an independent source and find out what the resulting voltage here at the terminal is and divide those quantities to get a resistance. I think in this particular circuit, it's easiest to use a current source and then find the voltage. So making those changes, I've zeroed out the independent sources down here, and I've introduced an explicit current source IC. Okay, so what is VC? I'm going to think about this as having two terms. One is the voltage difference between VC and VE, and that is something we're going to compute in this first term here. And the other is basically VE, which we'll compute here. So for that first voltage difference, I'll think about multiplying I0 times R0 according to Ohm's law, except here I'm going to write I0 in a particular way. Using Kirchhoff's current law, I can think about I0 as being IC minus this IC prime current here. Well, what about this voltage VE? So I could think about it in terms of using Ohm's law by multiplying IE times RTE, or I could think about it in terms of IB times the series combination of RTB plus R pi. But it will be convenient for me to express everything in terms of IC and dealing with all the alphas and betas that wind up resulting turns out to be kind of a mess. So one particular trick we could use is to realize, okay, well, there's a current IC flowing down here, and however it splits up between this IC prime and this I0 branch, by the time it's coming into here, it's IC. So I can think about IC running down a parallel combination of resistances to ground. One of the paths is this RTB plus R pi series combination, and that's in parallel with RTE. So that way I can write the expression just in terms of IC and IC prime. So let me rearrange this expression a little bit. I'm going to take all of the terms that have IC in them and group them together. So an R0 goes here, and this whole series combination in parallel with another resistance goes here. And then I'm going to take this IC R0 term, I'll write that down here, and notice that I've used the property that IC prime is equal to beta IB. That's something we computed in a previous lecture. And if we didn't have this R0 sitting here, I would be able to get rid of the prime here. But we do have the R0, so I have to be careful to think about the prime there. Now, I just wrote something with an IB, and I just made a big deal out of the fact that I really wanted everything in terms of IC. And so here's a trick that we can use. I can compute IB from IC using a current divider. So we think about the current IC coming down this direction here, and it's going to be split between these two branches. So in the denominator, I'll add up these resistances. And in the numerator, I want to put the resistance of the branch that we're not analyzing. I want the resistance of the opposite branch. We want to know what IB is, so the opposite branch has a resistance of RTE, so that's what goes in the numerator. And I need a minus sign here because the IB arrow is going the opposite direction of the IC arrow. So I can take this expression here and plug it in for IB here, and then the minuses wind up canceling. So making that substitution gives you this monstrosity. I can now compute our Thevenin resistance looking into the collector as VC minus IC. And when I divide by IC, basically these ICs wind up going away. And the only other thing I've done here is to factor out these R0 instances to write this as R0 times 1 plus all this mess. This is a messy expression. There's another expression we could derive for RIC. To spell out this expression, first let me define RIE as RTB plus R pi over 1 plus beta. I realize that this feels entirely unmotivated. We'll actually derive this expression and see where it comes from, not in the next lecture, but the lecture after that when we compute a Thevenin equivalent looking into the emitter of the small signal model. Right now, you can just take it on faith. Another way to write this expression is as RTB over 1 plus beta plus RE 
whichever formula you want to use, we can then write a formula for RIC that looks like this. So quite often this is easier to compute than this expression up here, but your mileage may vary. The second expression arises directly from computing the Norton resistance using the T model. So if we had used the T model, we would have gotten this expression. It takes about a page of algebra to move from one expression to the other, but you can do it. It's pretty tedious, so I won't torment you with that here. So here's the big picture. We can replace all of this mess, the small signal model, and all of the stuff on the other side of the emitter, and all the stuff on the other side of the base, with a Norton equivalent circuit that consists of a single current source and a single resistance. And we'll usually not bother to write out either the T model or the pi model. We'll just go straight from a BJT symbol representing the small signal model with whatever else is connected. We'll go right from there to the appropriate equivalent circuit. Okay, granted, the various formulas underlying the expression of IC and RIC are kind of a big, ugly mess. So there's a lot hiding under this simple-looking schematic right here. But looking at those formulas, they're big, but what are you doing? You're adding numbers, you're multiplying numbers, you're dividing numbers. You take the numbers for your problem, you plug them in, and you get a number, and you get a number. I like to think about Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits as playing the same kind of role that subroutines do in computer programming, or methods, or functions, or whatever you want to call them. They basically allow you to abstract some details so you can focus on higher level issues. If you go to Marshall Leach's ECE 3050 website, remember 3050 is an earlier number for what's now called 3400, you'll find this BJT formula summary sheet that has a summary of a bunch of the equations that we've derived so far and a bunch more that we'll derive in upcoming lectures. Note that the way Marshall has drawn this, the entire BJT is actually this BJT symbol plus this resistance R0. The BJT symbol sort of represents an ideal small signal BJT model without an R0 that has an IC prime and an IE prime. And then the IC is actually IC prime plus the current flowing through R0. And similarly, the real IE is IE prime plus that current flowing through R0. And what we just computed in this lecture is this Norton equivalent up here. And we'll use it when analyzing common emitter and common base amplifier configurations. Before we close out, I wanted to mention that the Norton equivalent circuit for the collector we formulated in this lecture is analogous to the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking into the base of a vacuum tube that I derived in my guitar amplification and effects class.